The police tomorrow stopping for engaging in police corruption, we still have black men killing black men. One and a handful of Muslims know what a pork chop tastes like. I try my best to look as non-threatening as possible in my hoodie. And, and, and a lot of us need a heart change. First and foremost, I, I won't talk to any specific issues. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, the divorce case is in litigation, right. as well as the stop and frisk is, is now in litigation. Right. Um, um, but listen, Commissioner Ramsey and I, I see Brother Kayum in, in, the, in the room, and we've met with, meeting with different individuals and, and, and discussing our framework for, for the police department. Um, we do not, and, and clearly, Commissioner Ramsey is, and Commissioner Ross has demonstrated that we're not going to tolerate. Let's first talk about corruption, two different things. Yeah. Corruption and, 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 and abuse. Um, the corruption issues are, we're very out front about the issues that are going on in the police department as it relates to corrupt issues. Um, and what you see now, I think, is, is, is the effort to be very open about the issues that we have. Uh, we are not perfect. I, I don't think we'd be sit there and flawed. And you know, Commissioner Ramsey was sitting here today, would tell you that we are not perfect individuals. Uh, and so when we have officers who engage in corrupt behavior, I think a lot of that is now the community is starting to push back and say we're not going to tolerate. Many of the cases that you've seen recently are guys who who normally and would fold in the tent and said I'm not going to be involved. Um, you see a, a the federal government in, 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 in some of the recent cases, the AG's office have stepped forward and say we're going to move, but no longer are we sitting back and moving you know at a snail's pace. We're moving quickly. You know, you know, in the past, I don't know, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, he said don't call Mr. Cord, but Mike would well know that those uh, those jobs lingered for a long time, sitting somewhere. And so Commissioner Ramsey has set the tone that we will not tolerate that type of activity in, in the department. Uh, and so we're moving uh, and moving quickly to eradicate that. And you see he'll come out front and fire these officers rather quickly. And, and so we're also putting in, you know, moving forward uh, within the police department to address the ethics. I mean, I bad to say honor, integrity, and service. It is a theme and core values that have to be reemphasized on a regular basis. With that comes professionalism. And so we will continue in our efforts internally to ensure that our officers are working in an ethical manner, and that they're not engaging in corrupt behavior, but also setting a tone that if they do engage in that type of behavior, this is what's going to happen to them. I mean, the two officers you just recently are have a million dollars bail and are still in custody. You know what I mean? And they will remain in custody because they cannot make that bail to demonstrate to the department that they are no different than the citizens that we serve. As it relates to the issues of physical violence, we're not, I'm not going to sit there and, and say that we don't have issues. We've met, I mean, we do have, it's an ongoing process. We have a young police department. Um, we have to work harder to make them understand that in their conduct, they have to be professional. And, and when those officers engage in that type of behavior, where they get physical, where they go beyond the scope of what their law and, and legal allows them to do, that we're going to take action. And, and so, and I think in, in the past, and, and, I, and, and Commissioner Ramsey has demonstrated, that when he has an officer who demonstrates that type of activity, that he immediately fires. Now you and I, everyone in this know, and Mike knows as well, that we have a very strong union. A lot of those officers have been able to come back to duty. Right. Uh, I don't have control over that part of it. Uh, but I do have control when an officer jumps up on top of a table in the lunchroom and calls kids the N-word, that he be fired. had said as a candidate that he endorsed this stop and frisk, and he did say that if he became mayor, that, that would be something that he would institute. And he mentioned, and I recall, I recall that campaign, that he was going to target this on certain hot areas, or certain areas in where there's a lot of uh, crime. Well, obviously, to me, those are buzzwords that says, you know, okay, certain sections in North Philly, certain sections in West Philly, Northwest, pockets where there's a heavy concentration of African Americans. Um, he was criticized, I remember, during the campaign. 
Nevertheless, he was mad, mad enough of his word, he did institute that. Do you feel that that creates this, this um, aggression? I don't, I can't, I, I won't say that. I, I will say that, and, and, and Michael, you know, he's attorney here. I mean, Terry versus Ohio, I mean, we've been, we've been involved in, and you can call it stop and frisk, head stops. I mean, you know, we've been involved in that process and, you know, Fourth Amendment for years of, of our, our process of stopping. I mean, the question that's come up is how we conduct that stop, you know, and do we articulate the facts that causes that. But we have to, we're going to have a conversation here. And if we're going to be, have a real conversation, you know, I'm an African-American man who sits here and, and watched so many of you know, his brothers kill himself. Yeah. Sergeant Byard is here, he's, in the, he's a homicide sergeant. He may take the mic and kind of tell you the intimate things that go behind that. I'm not putting him on blast when I say that, but just to get some support in the room. Um, but, <laughs> but, but, but the reality is, I mean, we have increased, we have more officers in our hot areas, our areas that we know where there's definable violence is going to occur. I can tell you at 54th and Chester, I will have a shooting. I'm not sitting there right now. And so, yeah, we are putting officers in those areas in an effort to stop our young African-American males from killing themselves. Now, we're taking from every area to do that. And we, we, I don't make any excuses for that. I mean, I have districts that have more officers. I mean, we have foot beats out. We had 240, 60 foot beats that went out last year on foot. They did not go to the mall. They did not go to Roosevelt Boulevard. They went into neighborhoods where Mothers and, and daughters and, and community people are clamoring saying, give me some relief. And so, yeah, as a result of that, if, if I'm putting those surge of officers into there, I'm going to have a significant number of increased stops of those individuals in those areas. But that's guided by intelligent, crime-fighting statistics that says, hey, when I look on the sheet and I say, if I look in this area, that the gravity, if I take you out to North Philly, as you say, a 2.2 square mile area that has 40 homicides and 200 something shooting victims, that, what, that yes, I'm putting officers in there in an effort to stop that from happening. And so I won't sit here and make any excuses, that, but we have to be conscious of how we do it. Whether we, just not knowing the targets that we're going after, not just grabbing anybody on the corner, having definable reasons, but sometimes that gets misguided. You know, if, if I have a shooting at 29th and Thompson tonight and two people are killed, yeah, you can guarantee I'm not letting anybody on the corner on 29th and Thompson tomorrow night. But maybe for the next two weeks in an effort to avoid the retaliation that comes back. And sometimes that's not articulated on any paper, but it's just to say, hey guys, you can't stand on the corner. But hey, what's going on? Well, I had two people get killed last night. You know what I mean? And so I don't want anybody on that corner. And so there is a, a balance, and we do have to be checked, and we have to be, make sure we're doing the right things in that process. Let me start off with what we disagree on, and that's when this whole stop and frisk. Uh, I'm a current member of the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union and a former state board member of the Pennsylvania ACLU. And we recently filed a lawsuit to stop, stop and frisk. And we're going to win that lawsuit. And the reason that we are, and I don't want to turn this into a legal seminar, but the deputy commissioner talked about a case, Terry versus Ohio. And without getting all complicated, that basically says that the police can stop you on the street, even without seeing you committing a crime, as long as they have reasonable suspicion. And let me spend 30 seconds talking about that before I get to something of more substance. This case, Terry versus Ohio, says that the police can stop and frisk. But they don't really say stop and frisk. They talk about this legal concept of reasonable suspicion. And what that means is this, because I noticed that when the mayor talks about stop and frisk, when the police commissioner talks about stop and frisk, they keep talking about this whole notion of reasonable suspicion. But it doesn't work like that. The case of Terry versus Ohio involved three men on a corner casing a joint. There was a jewelry store nearby. So the two guys were on the corner, looking over at the jewelry store, and then coming back to the corner. Then the third guy comes, and that third guy walks past the jewelry store and comes back to the three guys. Then a fourth guy comes, so three or four times these guys are casing the joint. A cop sees this whole thing take place for 15, 20, 30 minutes. Any reasonable law enforcement official would have, quote unquote, reasonable suspicion. So when I hear Law enforcement officials like the police commissioner and elected officials like the mayor keep equating stop and frisk with Terry versus Ohio. It's completely misguided because if you know anything about the facts of Terry versus Ohio, it just those four guys were not committing a crime, so there was no probable cause for the cops to arrest them. But they were engaging in conduct that any reasonable person would see as reasonably suspicious. Why do you keep walking past this jewelry store and don't go in? 
Why do you stop by and look in the window and then go to the other two guys? So this whole thing was taking place. Having said that, the police can arrest you if you're committing a crime or they have evidence you're committing a crime. That's probable cause. Nobody would be upset, black or white, if a guy was running down the street with a gun in his hand, they would demand that cops arrest him. In addition, if somebody saw four guys standing around a jewelry store and not going in, nobody would have any problem with the cops confronting these guys and say, hey, what's going on? Do a pat down, that kind of thing. But there's nothing in the U.S. Constitution and nothing in the Pennsylvania Constitution that talks about stop and frisk. Stop and frisk has no legal basis in federal law. It has no legal basis in state law. And very rarely will you hear an attorney prejudge the outcome of a case to say, hey, I know what's going to happen, but I can guarantee you that ultimately the ACLU is going to win on this stop and frisk because it's a dangerous concept. In fact, the Deputy Commissioner will agree with me that in the thousands of stops from the stop and frisk in thousands, only about 2% resulted in any arrest. 2%. So what does that mean? 98% of the people are stopping and nothing comes out of it, and the vast majority of those who are poor and black. I was born and raised in North Philly. So does that mean that Michael Cord, born and raised in North Philly, has to be stopped and frisked because I'm, I'm not a white guy who lives in Center City? So if I'm a white guy who lives in Center City, I'm not going to be stopped and frisked because that's not a high crime area. But if I'm a black guy in North Philly, I'm going to be stopped and frisked. So the Constitution doesn't say we apply as a Constitution in Center City, but we don't apply in North Philly. It applies everywhere. So the, con the notion of stop and frisk is illegal and unconstitutional, and any state court and federal court will agree with that. I, I was reminded of my blackness a few weeks ago. <laughs> I live in Delaware County. I work in Center City. I usually uh, wear a suit pretty much every day of the week. But um, I came home, I changed clothes, and I ran up to the store. Uh, my wife needed something for the acne. So I come up to uh, the, there's a, I forget the name plus that I was getting some gas from. I pull up um, behind a, a woman who has her back towards me, and I had some stuff I wanted to get off my windshield. But the only dispenser for the little squeegee was right next to her. And, and Mike, as I approached her, I tried my best to look as non-threatening as possible in my hoodie. As non-threatening as possible in my hoodie. And as and I tried to even cough and make noise as I approached her as to not startle her. Because the last thing I wanted her to do was turn around and leave me face to face. Well, needless to say, I was reminded of, 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 <laughs> of my descent when, when she turned around and saw me reaching for the squeezy, squeegee and she her purse and backed up against her car and, and I immediately put both hands up and, and this is the this is the position that in whenever I'm stopped because of, of of the color of my skin I'm very aware of that I don't make sudden move if my wallet is in my briefcase in the back seat I will not get it I will not get it I'm gonna ask permission to get it and and that this is frustrating in our community but at the same time I hold my own self responsible because I can't I can't change why it's like this I can only try to be a catalyst to change what it is now. This, this whole concept of being stopped because we live in North Philadelphia or West Philadelphia or inner city. I grew up in West Philadelphia. Um, I was blessed enough to, and I worked for years, educated myself, built a career. As you know, I'm an author of 15 books. Yes. I built my own house from the ground up. I paid for it myself. I own the house and the land. Now, I live in what they call an upscale community. Yes. For the first year of living in that community, just going out every day to walk was a challenge for me because I would get stopped because I'm the only African American in the whole community. Just by my mere presence, I was stopped and I had to show identification. Now, I felt threatened by that. You know, I wanted to hold the whole town meeting. <laughs> I want to, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm being invited the whole thing, but I had to realize this is how it is. So no matter where you go, those dynamics are there. You know, my son has experienced it. I have a son. He has experienced it. I'm teaching him. You cannot change what's going on around you in the sense that, that you have to take ownership for yourself, what you do to improve you. <clears throat> You can't blame, as we say, the white man. I mean, 
where we come from has a part in where we are. But where we go from here, everybody has to take ownership of that. Young men that are sitting in the neighborhood that I go and see, and they have guns, they have drugs, and I ask them, have you been to Afghanistan? Uh, they haven't been. Uh, have you ever been to Central America? They haven't been. Uh, so they never went to get the heroin, they never went to get the cocaine, but somebody went through an awful lot of trouble to make sure that it fell right in their lap in the neighborhood. <laughs> On our watch, um, yeah, 40% of us are being murdered, uh, gun violence, and 90% of it is us killing us, but it's not one black gun manufacturer on the planet. Uh, where are the guns coming from? How does Rwanda get guns? You know, how does the Congo get guns? The same way South Philly and West Philly and North Philly gets guns. Uh, you know, and we can catch people, well, we're going to stop and frisk, which is up 148%, but we want to find out if they got a gun on them. That's what you're frisking for, I guess. Um, but while you're stopping and frisking them for a gun, not one gun trafficker has been arrested in this city. You can put on the stats how many people are dying every day, but what about the gun traffickers? Uh, the people that really bring guns in. I'm not talking about a, a few straw purchases here and there. I mean, that's bad enough, but there's some serious gun trafficking going on to supply guns for a city the size of Philadelphia. Um, and I think something ought to come under that. I live under a strong gun law. I came with Minister Farrakhan 30 years ago. Um, they didn't, he didn't ask me to grow into an understanding why I didn't need a gun. Uh, you, you can't come with me if you're going to carry a gun. That was it. That was it. And I loved him enough to get rid of my guns. And so for 30 years, I have not carried a firearm. I'm not against us living under a strong gun law because I live under one and I represent the only community in the city of Philadelphia where none of us carry guns, despite what American Gangster says. We don't have any guns. Uh, I wrote the mayor about my disappointment in his language when he first came in because he sent a signal. This stop and frisk sends a signal of how to handle us. And when people in the suburbs and people in other parts of the state are reading about how they're dealing with us in the city of Philadelphia. Well, the way one hand of law enforcement handles us, that's the way the other hand is going to handle us. Uh, so we, we have to go at it uh, for some of those terms, too. Somehow, we didn't just come out of a vacuum and start killing, maiming, murdering. And obviously, we know that's not every, every black man. But Michael Corey did state some facts based on the statistics, okay? Now, I even read some things that even, even skew those numbers. Obviously, something's way out of control. Um, Deputy Police Commissioner, uh, I know that you know this. Um, there have been officers that people, um, some brothers have opened fire on, have more firepower than sometimes the police officer equipment. All right, assault weapons. And to Minister Rossi's point, I know they're not going and manufacturing these guns and have these brothers don't own manufacturing companies. Um, I want to get your take on that because obviously these guys are on the corner uh, and, 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 as they're doing whatever illegal activity and your, and your men are coming upon them and they're returning some serious fire and we had, of course, several police officers who have been killed in the line of duty. Mm -hmm. um, give me, your, just give me your, your, your sense of that. I mean, listen, we're seeing a significant rise in, in the amount of man the amount of the caliber weapon we see. I mean, the, it's frightening. We, it, it's frightening. I mean, the revolver was, was you know, and then it moved to the, to the uh, 40 caliber and the 45 caliber, and then we have the guys who pick up the casings after they shoot so that we can't find them. You know what I mean? And, and so, I mean, just last night, I had one of my officers in the 17th district. I mean, he comes about two officers that are having a shootout. I mean, two groups having a shootout. And they just discharge on helmets. I mean, I sit there with you know Officer Palacios' family, and, and here's an officer just comes up, and the guy shoots from his pocket and kills him. I mean, and we're seeing a significant rise in the type of weaponry that we see out there, and we are forced obviously to adjust to that. 
I mean, we moved to a higher caliber weapon to meet that challenge. Um, and, and so when I, I listened to, I mean, for me, I mean, I, I wish I could get into those other auxiliary dynamics, and, and I listened to uh, Mr. Muhammad and, and the, where they're coming from. A lot of the straw purchases are, are, are happening right in our community. I mean, we need to keep that real. You know, the guy goes to a friend, or in most cases a female, and asks her if you go down there and buy a gun. Yeah. And then two days later, she makes a report that I had a party at the house, and I looked in the drawer, and my two AK-47s, my Tech 9, and my three 9 millimeters were taken. They were in the sock drawer, and I looked up, and they were gone. And then we'll do the, you know, the time, the crime, and you look up, and six, 90 days later, that gun is used in, in an offense on the street. I mean, and so, so the reality is, even though, yes, they're coming from afar, um, the reality is that we are using that system to ensure that our young people, I mean, where does a 15-year-old get a 40 caliber gun from? Mm -hmm. I mean, where does he get that from? You know what I mean? And the community is not really asking those questions. You know what I mean? And, and so you sit there and, and you, you say to yourself, my God. I mean, I can't tell you how many young, young men uh, we're seeing with, with, with weaponry. I mean, so far this year we've covered about 2,800 guns. I mean, uh, you know, some from in the houses and on the street and, and, and through our arrest process. That's a significant number. You know I mean? And, and those guns are being used. And I mean, the days of, of I, I had a young man in my office one day. And I'm sitting there looking at him and said, well, what, what ever happened to fighting? Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I came through as a young man. My brother remembered the gang wars and Christian Street, Osage Avenue, and all that. And, and they had their zip guns and all that. But before they did all that stuff, there was a lot of fighting, too. And, and he said, you know, he said, he said, listen, at the time I was a captain of 17, he said, listen, I will fight a guy one on one, but but somebody in that crowd is going to pull a gun. He said, so why should I go through all that beating and all that stuff? I might just pull a gun from right now and do it and get it over. I, I just had a case the other day where an individual was spent 12 years in prison for an offense that he did in the street. The day he walked out, the guy who, who he was involved in shot him nine times. I mean, so we have we have a lot of, of anger. We have a lot of internal issues, and, and the gunplay uh, in our communities is out of control. I mean, if anybody doesn't believe that, I mean, for every we have 1,400 and some odd shooting victims so far this year. 1,400 shooting victims so far. The majority of them are African American males. Of that number, about 279 is about is homicides. Again, the majority of them are African American males. I mean, and so the gun, and now that now mind you, that's the ones that have been hit. You know, we have another 500 more jobs, over 2,000, where we have shooting incidents. We log our incidents as well, where people have shot and they just missed. You know, I went, I left, I had a, you know, it, it, about a month ago, I, I, I get a job, and I get a job where a three-year-old and a nine-year-old shot. I look at my wife. I said, Well, I'm going to chop. I, I got to see for myself. I put my uniform on and I got in my car. Mm -hmm. When I arrived at the hospital, I got a nine-year-old who, who was in the middle of a gun battle, 60 person woman, I believe it was, and he, and he shot, he fortunate, but he shot through his, his cheeks. He, that's fortunate. And I'm looking at this young man in significant pain. And then I said, well, where is the three-year-old? And, and he's in the OR. You know what I mean? And he has to get his whole entire insides repaired. You know, and, and so you're sitting there saying to yourself, so yeah, I sit back sometimes and say, yo, come on, guys. Mm -hmm. do, now listen, I'm all about all the things and the tax that we get as a, as, a, as a police department, we deserve it. Keep us in check. I don't have any problem when, when Mr. Corden and all of them, Michael, <laughs> it, you know, comes at us. He goes, yeah, you know, I'm okay with that. But the, also the argument sitting there saying, when I stood over there, I went to the scene. I said, I want to see where this happened at. I'm not going to hear, I haven't heard nothing from the community. You know what I mean? And I don't hear anything saying, well, we, well what? Now, we ultimately personally took that as a front, and my detectives were able to bring that case to, to bear. But yeah, the, the gunplay in our community is out of control. It is fueled and phoned within our community. And if we don't sit there and take a hard check, because everybody knows where the guns are coming from, that people know who the straw purchases are on in, in our neighborhoods, and, and facilitate the, the, that type of behavior, and we're going to continue to have these struggles that we have. If the police stopped tomorrow engaging in unconstitutional behavior, if the police tomorrow stopped engaging in police brutality, 
if the police tomorrow stopped engaging in police corruption, we still have black men killing black men. And that's an important thing we got to figure out. I don't like to throw out stats because they get all jumbled, but I just want to throw out some numbers that people should be aware of. About more than 40% of murder victims in America are black. More than 40% of murder victims in America are black. 90% of those black murder victims was killed by other black people. That's a frightening concept. 40% of the murder victims in America are black, but 90% of those people who were killed were killed by other black people. And most of those who were killed were between the ages of 15 and 24. So most of the black murder victims killed by other black people are ages 15 to 24. So even if we stopped stop and frisk, even if we stop what happened to Askia Sabor, even if we stop what happened to Rodney King and Amadou Diallo, we got to deal with the problem of black folks doing what they do to each other. And that's critically important. One final stat I'll throw out, which was shocking to me. There was a study done to show that the chance that a white male age 18 being murdered is about one and a half in 10,000. Let me repeat that. The chances of a white male age 18 being murdered is about one and a half out of 10,000. But the chances of a black male age 18 being murdered is 12 times higher at 15 out of 10,000. And those black murder victims are not being killed by white cops in the building. So we got to deal with that. And people say, well, Mike, if you keep throwing out these numbers and you recognize that the big problem is, why do you focus on police brutality? Why do you rant and rave about that? Why is it when a cop does something wrong, like police officer Christopher D. Pesquale shooting and killing Dante Dawson, an unarmed black teen in North Philly, why are you always jumping on that? But when Raheem in the projects shoots Muhammad in the projects, you're not complaining about that. And the answer is very simple because the DA's office and the police will go after Raheem. They'll go after Muhammad, but they won't go after Christopher D. Pasquale. So I'm here to say somebody's got to police the police because the police are not policing the police. I'm doing it because it needs to be done, but I recognize the biggest elephant in the room, the giant gorilla in the room that black people are not talking about are crimes committed by blacks against blacks. And I'll wrap this up by saying this. that every year 600,000 people are released from prison. Every year. And in the same year, 300,000 of those who were released go back. I have seen this in my own prison ministry. We have to deal with the issue of black on black crime. And people say, well, Mike, in terms of this whole black on black crime, there's got to be a reason for it. And there is a reason. It's one of two reasons. One, it's that black people are genetically predisposed to commit crimes. That's one theory. Black people are just biologically born criminals. One theory. But then there's another theory that today's racism is the residue of yesterday's slavery. Clearly, it's not that we're genetically predisposed. Racism and the residue of slavery plays a role, but there's a way to resolve it. I think that there is a major, major responsibility and obligation, community obligation, on the police department to do their part. But I also believe that there is an onus that lies on the community to make sure that something's being done to not only raise our children, but to hold our community accountable for their actions. Locus of control works like this. If you have a low locus of control, you fail the test, and someone asks you, why did you fail the test? They say, well, the teacher didn't give me the right um, information. Uh, the school didn't have the book I needed. I went to the library, it was closed. Everything is external. And I think that the reason why sometimes our plights aren't taken seriously in the African-American community is that whenever we complain, it's always someone else's fault. A high locus of control would be the fact that when someone asks you, why did you fail the test? You say, quite honestly, I didn't study. 
I played around with my time. I watched MTV. I did this. I did that. I hung out. And when I came, when it came to the test, I was prepared. That's an internal explanation of why you failed the test. And when we look at our community, it's, it's so that there are problems upon problems upon problems. But if we would just talk about economics, we we are taught to buy our wants and beg our needs. There's no accountability where we are financially. There's no money going into our community because it all goes to King of Prussia, it all goes to Franklin Mills, and it all goes to Springfield Mall. Let's just be realistic about it. So with those economic dollars leaving our community, it's a joke, it, it, it's a byword to say, let's support black owned businesses in our community. It's a joke. Why? Because when you go into those, uh, those businesses, they are poorly prepared. So I'm not gonna, I, I can't see me investing money in something that's sub subpar, sub quality. So there, there has to be this, this trickle-down effect of responsibility and this tipping point where we start holding our community responsible for our behavior because nobody's more responsible for you than you. It comes out of slavery. And when I say it comes out of slavery, I wasn't joking at the outset when I said that the problems that we have in our community, there's a reason for it. One reason is that we're genetically predisposed. All of the stuff the Deputy Commissioner said is right in terms of what black people are doing and shooting the kids. You gotta ask yourself, why are they doing that? It's either because it's something biologically and genetically wrong with them to make them sociopathic like that. That's one theory. The other theory is that there's something in society that led to that. We talked earlier, we're doing the introduction about my connection with hip hop. You look at hip hop and of course black people are the performers of hip hop, white people are the consumers of hip hop. In fact, about 80%, 85% of all hip hop persons are by white folks and the folks who run the record labels are white folks. So when you get a public enemy back in the 90s talking about fighting the power, fighting the man, they're banned. But when you got 50 Cent talking about shooting niggas and hanging with bitches and selling drugs, that's spread all over the place. Why is that message going out like that? Why can't you hear Public Enemy and Brand Nubian and Queen Latifah and Dead Prez talk on the radio and TV about raising up the black man and woman, but when you talk about the negativity, it's out there. Who controls the airwaves? Who controls the media? Who constantly bombards us? So when you look at how the system is designed to tell that young black man who shot those kids, as the deputy commissioner is talking about, he sees, the whole, he sees it as a badge of honor to have a gun, to be a thug, to be a gangster. And it's corny to marry your girlfriend. It's corny to take care of your kids. It's corny to go to college. It's corny to do all that stuff. So clearly, as I said, and, and a lot of people say, well, Mike, you got this bleeding heart liberal thing. You're constantly blaming the white man. No, because we do have a responsibility to do the right thing. But why is Michael Cord a lawyer and all the guys I grew up with are either dead or in jail or in drugs? Am I much better than them? No, there before the grace of God, go I. But if I was a white boy who grew up in the Northeast, then most of my friends are not dead. Most of my friends are not in prison. Most of my friends have not dropped out of high school. So you gotta ask yourself, why is it that Michael Kors, as the black guy, is the exception, but the white guy in the Northeast who does well is not the exception? In fact, he's the rule. So all of the stuff that those stats I threw out are true. All of the points that were made by the Deputy Commissioner are true, but you gotta ask yourself, why? And let's go back in time. Well, it's that way because of segregation early on, 40s and 50s, and that came out of Jim Crow, and that came out of sharecropping, and that came out of slavery. So you keep going back in time, you see that these black folks are constantly beaten down by the system. A couple of things I want to say, and I'll wrap this up in two minutes. The analogy I always give people is that the condition of the black man and the white man is like a race, a trap meet. And every time the race is run, the white guys are always winning. That's why the white guys make more money. The white guys have better education. The white guys own more property. In every race, the white guys win, but the black guys lose. And then people say, well, Mike, this is year 2010. Black folks ought to do better. And I give them the race analogy. And the reason why the white guy's doing better because he's been training for 300 years. He's been exercising for 300 years. He's been taking vitamins and probably steroids. <laughs> On top of all that, the black guy is shackled. The black guy is mistreated. The black guy is brutalized. But now that the race starts, 
the man takes the shackles off the black guy and say, go ahead and run the race. And I'm like, running the race? This guy's been training for 300 years. Why is it that on every black corner in some of the poorest, most degraded areas that there's a church, yet there's rampant crime? On Chester Avenue, lots of churches. What is, there seems to be a dis, there, there seems to be this disconnect, all right? Now I want to pull the, the, the ministers from the from the Nation of Islam, Law Foundation of Islam into this discussion as well. But I want to first spin this over to our Christian brothers because you know, we go in the service and we have a high anointed service. I want to see that high anointing come out and fill out and just slay the neighborhood. So then it is basically Deputy Police Commissioner and his officers basically nothing to do. What is the dis <laughs> disconnect um, with yeah. churches and all these hot pots, hot pockets, yet there's rampant, unchecked crime? I want to address the, uh, I think, the unfairness of uh, the question. It almost assumes that because there is a church, and it's not in defense of the church, right. but to balance it out, yes. that because there is a church on every corner, that somehow the church is responsible for the behavior that takes place in the community. I believe the church has a, a, a responsibility to aid, because we're teachers. Yes. But it, it would beg to ask the question, is the church meeting its obligation for why it was created? The church is a place of worship. That's what it was designed for, a place of prayer. That would be like saying, why is everybody in West Philadelphia sick when there's a Rite Aid within five blocks of everybody's house? Or why do we have, why are we inferior academically when there is a school within three blocks of everybody's house? Is it the school's fault that everybody in that vicinity is academically inferior? Is it the church's fault that there's crime in the community because it's on the corner? In my opening statement, I said maybe the, the causes which are clear, maybe we don't need to talk about the causes as much because we know how we got here. Or the conditions. Maybe we need to address the challenge. How do we get every person to take responsibility for themselves and their own self-empowerment. You have to get involved more, obviously, because of the situation we're in. But the community have to participate. A lot of times the churches do go out, and I know I can speak for my church in particular, we go out and we minister, and we go in the corners, we go in people's houses, and we see the condition. A lot of times, you know, with the influences, with the influences that we have in society, people got a tendency to woo the church, not to come as, as I believe that they should, because we reaching out for help for you know, I mean, for their community. The church is a light in the community, and unless the community get involved, a church will be ineffective. We have to, in the church, like, like um, Pastor Steve said about mentors, fatherless homes, uh, men in general, black men in general, we have to come up a notch or two to make a difference in society. We can't, one entity ain't going to do it. The police force, the justice system is not going to do it. Lawyers is not going to do it. We need, we need the people involvement. We need people that care about their uh, society, their community, where they live, how, how, the, how they live. Sometimes we all, like most of the time we live in the black community, we see all the crime that's going on. We see the drugs, drug addict taking over the community. We live in that stuff and too afraid to do anything about it. But see, what we got to do as a church and as a community come together and maybe work with these entities. Because they cannot do it by themselves. Right. Law lawyers, they can't do it by themselves. Mm -hmm. 
the church, we can't do it by ourselves. We, the community of people have to reach out and care about enough about their brothers and sisters in themselves to get involved. I mean, the influence out here today is pretty strong, and, uh, and, and most people don't seem to have the strength to overcome it, so they just, they just melt into that lifestyle. They just, the church is there, and the church is reaching out. But you got to want it. You got you to gotta get your hope and your confidence back, not only in the church, the police force, Lord, but in yourself. You see, and, and unless we do that as a people, as a whole, we fight the losing game. It's going to get worse. And as we see, it get worse every single year. Young brothers got to step up to the plate and start taking care of business. I mean, obviously, I can make an excuse. My father wasn't there for me in the streets. You know, I grew up in the streets. So what So what my mentality like when I'm 18? When, when my parents kicked me out of the home. What I'm going to do? I had no father. I had a proper training. I better get into some church and ask somebody to help me. I don't want to. My brother got killed in the streets selling drugs. He got shot four times. My little nephew. 24. I don't want to go out like that. But what type of skills and knowledge and information do I have that can prevent this type of uh, uh, lifestyle? Obviously, if I'm in the corner doing my things, if the cops see me, I mean, and I'm out there, I mean, come on, y'all. I mean, the suspicion is there. We, as black people, we marked all over the world. Anywhere we go, when we walk in, they see a black face, they already got the image. Boy Elijah Muhammad said, a real Muslim is a Christian. And he said to us, a real Christian is a Muslim. I represent one of the, I'm one of the few handful of Muslims on the planet that didn't start in the mosque. I started in a church. Uh, I was on a morning bench. I was baptized in a Baptist church. But I'm in a mosque now. I didn't start with Muhammad. I started with Jesus. So I know both of them now. And I know the value. I'm one of a handful of Muslims know what a pork chop tastes like. Pork in the East can't tell me nothing. No Arab can guide me. No Pakistani can guide me. There's nobody that can come from nowhere else and guide me into Islam. You know, I follow the Honorable Louis Farrakhan as I tell them when they come to our mosque, they want to tell me how Islam is supposed to go. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad has revoked that. And they have lost their right to dictate to us what Islam is and how uh, Islam should be expressed and how it should go. But we're living in an age of the mega church. But Ebenezer Baptist Church, the church of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had less than 300 members. It wasn't a mega church by numbers, but it got mega results. And we got big churches, but they got many results today. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I extend my hand to any pastors that want to work beyond the halls of the church. I believe that our houses of worship are a place for us uh, to follow uh, a certain discipline to fortify ourselves so that when we go out into the world, we can go out as real saints uh, to make change. We are God's change agents. Uh, and we, we're going to do this with the word of God. We're not going to set the word of God aside and just deal with this uh, politically. I believe the political world has failed us. Uh, because they will swear themselves and put their hand on a Bible that they never intend to open to learn how to rule over God's people. Amen. I had never uh, viewed any type of YouTube footage of um, uh, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. The man, for lack of a better term, killed him. And the one thing that resounded, that, that resonated in me was his demand for people to stand up where they were. And I think what's been absent from the church was this demand for it standing up where we are right now. There's a great emphasis put on heaven, there's a great emphasis put on the afterlife and preparation for that. But in that, I feel that there have been times that there's been a breakdown of preparing people to live today, to take um, responsibility in their community and to be good leaders, to be not just great members of a church, but to be productive people in the society and to bring economic relief to the, to the areas that they grew up in. One of these churches that are on the corner, as a captain, do not represent the community there. 
in the sense that most people are traveling. Their pastor leaves from West Philly and he moves up North Philly, and then they're moving to North Philly. You know, you see the cars come. I remember going to a church and sitting there talking about, can you? And the pastor say, you know, well, all my members are not really. They're from all over. They're coming from Jersey. It's a lot of traveling, moving around, and 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 so. But I also will say this. That's not. I know we have this dialogue, but not. There's a lot of good work going on in our community. That's right. That's right. And, and I think you got to be careful when people stand up and say, well, where is everybody at? Right. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? Because you, I mean, they're not walking around with tags on right. and, and saying, well, listen, I'm doing I got a little young mentee who couldn't come in there and had to compete with a bowling party. He's from 17 district where I was. Both of his been killed by gunfire, and we made a commitment to getting him through. But there's a lot of people doing a lot of good work, which is keeping a lot of, listen, if they weren't doing that, I said, listen, take the police away. Take all the people doing good stuff away, take your churches away, and stand back. If you want to see it, get a litmus test of what really is going on. Uh, I'm sitting in uh, uh, Mapanex Park one, 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 one nice sunny day, and a Jehovah Witness comes, and I notice she passed the, um, the thugs, passed right by them. There was a couple of Muslim sisters passed right by them. Then there was a couple of sisters over they were sitting on the bench cursing and carrying on. But you know what's interesting? I said, I know it's like they're gonna come right next to me. <laughs> so enough, uh, they came to me and said, you know, we'd like to interest you in reading the um, um the watch out. And I said, well, why did you walk by the, the thugs over there? Because they really need that watch out. <laughs> so anyway, we started dialoguing and they kind of left me alone because they obviously knew I they, they could see that I, I had studied the Bible in this. But there it is my problem. There's a real need, but you ignore that need because you come over to what feels safe, you know. And too many times, and I'm not trying to be unfair, sir, but I think too many times I, I see with some, and, and you know, I'm a Christian, but I gotta, I just gotta be honest. Sometimes I feel that some in our community fear the very people that need our help the most. Right. that we need mentors. Every man needs a mentor. I believe that you will repeat, watch this, you will repeat even what you hated if you don't see another model. I know men who were raised by abusers who couldn't stand their fathers but because they didn't see another model, another mentor, they emulate that same behavior. That's right. And I made money, I spent my money according to the pattern of a thug. The Bible says we were created in God's image and after his likeness. And so the likeness of you, the way you function, the way you operate is according to and it corresponds with the image that you have of yourself. We got to have a change on the inside. We got to change the image of the way young men see themselves. And when you change the image, then you tend to try to construct a life that complies with the image that you have of yourself. So if we go after some of those kinds of things, that's spiritual warfare. Yes, Last year I had the opportunity to go to court with a young man whose parent contacted me for mentoring <coughs> and life coaching services. Part of his conditioning for house arrest was that he would submit to life coaching. The judge, and, and it was amazing because I sat there and the, and the prosecutor that sat across from us was infuriated. She could not believe, the judge sat there for a minute. He said, I'm gonna do something I've never done before. I'm gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna allow you two conditions. He had to get enrolled in college, which I'm an enroll, enrollment advisor for the University of Phoenix, so I was able to handle that portion as well. But he also had to be in sessions twice a month for life coaching to develop um, anger management and uh, better decision-making skills. Now, the problem that I began to find is something that um, uh, uh, Reverend Walker mentioned was that whole model piece. When in the absence of a model, you, you tend to gravitate to the image that's bombarded to you. If you ride down the street, you know where you are based on the billboards that you begin to see, based on the pictures that are depicted to you. And in the absence of a true model, all our children in our communities, and this young man, as we began to do coaching, he asked me one night, he said, we were on the phone, he said, what do I do when I have no choice? I have no options. What do they want me to do? And I sat there and did not have an answer for him. Because how do you help someone when they say, I have no choice, I have no options? 
In other words, the community, the people, the system, he felt like failed him and he was justified for selling weed. Because after all, it's not heroin. It's just a little weed. He was justified in having two children out of will. Why? Because what, am, what else am I going to do with my time? And until we start building a system and that, that, that uplifts and changes that self-image, because you can't have empowerment without an image. You can't have an image without a model. You can't have a model unless you have mentors who are willing to step up and sacrifice. Because right now, we're absent as the older I'm 39. I know I look 21, but I'm actually 39 years old. And I have, a, I have an obligation to turn around and strengthen because this next generation is only going to be as tall as the people whose shoulders they're standing on today. Young men have come to us and they've been, they've been converted. They live a much more better, uh, productive lives. Some of them are married now uh, and that. But many times, once they leave the, the mosque or any kind of setting that we have, they go back to homes now. It used to be if you could just stay off the street, but now many homes are very dysfunctional and they're going back to situations now and, 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 and baby brothers pushing drugs, there's drugs in the house or, you know, and the way that we're living. So we do have some challenges in that, but I do believe that we gotta go, we gotta go where the, where the fight is. Uh, but we gotta be real with people. That's why we need a whole lot more uh, leadership, strong leadership. Like you said, you walk past and you see, you speak to them and they look up to you. You know what I mean? Everybody say, what's up over here? And they give you that respect. We need more leaders in the streets of our city because that, what's, that leadership is what's going to change our city. I mean, and we need more. We need a lot more. And that's why it's, it's up to us to step forward, forward to take that position. Like sometimes I say, uh, it's on the people we got to get involved. And when we talk about we, See, look, everybody get quiet. Everybody just look. But unless you get involved, I'm telling you, change will not take place. I have a church with a whole bunch of uh, young people in it. I mean, we got the young ladies that's pregnant, that's single, crying about the black man. We got the black young black brothers in there crying about the prayer pressure, the influences in the world, and bulls, and this and that. But yet, where is the men that can school or dialogue with these young brothers to help them to get along. They trying. The young sisters, they ain't in the church. They really trying to come out of this stuff. The young brothers is trying to come out of it. But we need more leadership men in uh, these areas to dialogue with these young people to help them. But before you can do it, you got to get free yourself. About the problem of black folks today, my personal experience in Masterman is a microcosm for it because think about it. I was born and raised to a single mother in North Philly. For whatever reason, I did well academically. Instead of the system giving more money to the Pratt Arnold School I was going to at 22nd and Dolphin, they take Michael Cord out of that school and they put him in Masterman mm -hmm. where their kids are already doing well. So why take the one quote-unquote smart kid out of the school and put him someplace where they're always doing ready, doing well already, and just provide additional funding at the North Philly Pratt Arnold School at 22nd and Dolphin, and you don't have the criminals later on, black men committing crimes, because now they had computers, they had books. But instead of building up that North Philly school, the system said, we'll just take this one kid out and give him something, but ignore the masses. That's the problem. Michael said something that I thought was profound. He said he was transferred from Master, from Pratt to Master. And he did academically well. And then he said, I don't know, but for whatever reason. That was the reason why he was transferred. I was because he was more gifted, or they, they perceived him to be academically gifted, that he should be moved into an environment to call me. Uh, which is which is where my problem comes in with we understand the condition how can we help he said we are an exception I'm, I'm assuming he's talking about us at the table right. that we made it 
and for lack of a better terminology, out right. or above the circumstances of our community. Mm -hmm. How can we help every other person take ownership of their own life mm -hmm. to become their own exception? Because, I mean, they moved him because he should have been moved. That's right. I mean, I, I, I just think he should have been moved. If he was gifted in an environment that couldn't cultivate, that he should have been moved. Because, it, it, for, I, of course, I know a pastor, I got to do this. Yes. There was a man in the Bible who was at a pool for 38 years. Yes. Yeah. 38 years with a bunch of six, sick people right. waiting for one event, the troubling of the water. Right. When Jesus came by and said, uh, do you want me to be whole? The man said, I do, but I have no man to help you. He said, watch this, while I am coming, another steps up before me. Wait a minute, if you're impotent and can't walk, then how are you coming? So it wasn't that the man couldn't get to the ward, he was just lazy. That's right. Jesus said, if you want to be made whole, then you take up your own bed. You want me as the savior of the world to wave a wand over you and get you up. I'm not getting you up. I came here to tell you what nobody told you in 38 years. If you want to get up, Dorothy, you can click your own heels and go home. If How do we help every other man if 20% of African American men are unaffected by the ills of our community, then how can we help the 80% that are affected? What did the 20% do? What did they do to get out of it? Um, moving him, I do feel, uh, in one way I feel that they want to place him somewhere where they feel that he can fare better. But it's, it's, it's running away from the big elephant in the room that if one student is moved, there's a whole lot of them that are still sitting there. Uh, what's wrong with that, with, that, with that school and that educational center? When we, when we send our children, first of all, the child, when the child is born, the child is successful in everything that it wants to do in its first year of life. It wants to, it wants to crawl, it, it keeps going until it crawls. When the child takes his first steps and we want to get the, that Kodak moment, almost always after one step, two step, no more than three, the child falls. Did you notice that the child will get right back up, fall again, but it'll get right back up, fall again, and it will keep getting up and falling till it can get up and never fall again. The child don't know failure until we teach it failure. That's right. Your child is showing genius until you get him into these, these uh, institutions and all of a sudden he got attention deficit disorder. Uh, special education has grown to a phenomenal. When I was in grade school, I never saw, you saw two or three people over and you said, what, what kind of classroom is that? And that was special education. The whole darn school is special education now. <laughs> they get uh, more money out of everybody uh, there. So, um, you know, I'm just saying that these people are supposed to be the stewards of the development and the cultivation of the life of our children. The problem is they got him in it, so he got out of what they had Michael in. Who is they? And what are they doing putting somebody in this? You know, white folks in the business now giving us medals and trophies for going through the mess they put us through. And he went through this and he overcame. Well, who put these hurdles up for me to be going over? Uh, you know, we got to it, 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 back away. We got to redefine this whole thing. This whole script is wrong. And yes, uh, I'm a thug. Yes, I'm killing. If I got a, a costume on and I'm saying a certain script, I got to own up to the script that I'm that I'm reciting, and I gotta I gotta own up to the role that I'm playing on the stage. But I did not write this play. Remember that. So you talk about them taking him from one situation and putting him in the other. But what he did not really explain to you is why they put him in the other situation. They put him in the other situation in hopes to manipulate his intellect to use them in their progress of keeping us subdued. 
That's actually what they did. You know what I mean? They took him out of, out of the neighborhood, hoping that when they manipulated his mind, that he would help to subdue the rest of us in the situation. That's why they put him in master. You know what I mean? But see, Michael did change. He did. He did make it. So it blew up in his face. It blew up in his face, so to speak. You know, but this is what they do with us. See, what, what we really have to realize is this. Education has a value and it can be a detriment. Mm -hmm. What are you being educated for? Mm -hmm. And how will you use that education? Are you an exchange student? Where are you taking that education to when you receive it? Are you taking it back to your community to do what? <coughs> or are you taking it inside the structure of the slave master to enhance his structure? here, now, and in the future. How does America view you and where you fit in it? How do the Republicans view you? Are there going to be available jobs for you? You may have to ask yourself that. Where do you fit in in the scheme of things? Where will our children fit in in the scheme of things? What groundwork are we laying for our own future? Or are we asking someone else to lay the ground? These are the questions we need to be dealing with because in reality, since we have been here, someone else has laid our ground. They have always laid our ground. They have always looked at us and put us in a position that they thought we should be. And this is the reality of that. Now, in the 60s, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad <coughs> came about and he laid the groundwork. And he began to take the black man and put him in his proper place. He began to re educate him. He began to give him the essential knowledge that he needed to attain to, uh, to gain independence for himself. Now, after 1975, what did we do? We reverted back to asking the people who put us in the position, lay the groundwork for us again. <laughs> this is where we are. Now we're sitting here now, 2010, and Brother Kevin has to call a conference to what? Ask ourselves, who's laying the groundwork? We know who laying the groundwork. It ain't us. We're not laying no groundwork. Education is failing. And our children are in that system. We were told, create your own system. Educate yourself. We refuse that. So now we're here every conference. You know what I mean? Here's a brother saying, well, we got black on black now. This is the percentage. We were given the information to what? Alleviate black on black crime. We refused it. Now we have the You see? So you are asking someone else to deal with your own issues instead of dealing with it yourself. You've been taught how. There is a groundwork for you. It's been here all along. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad left a whole entire litany of information for you. Yes. But because someone else told you that's racist, you refused it. And now you're losing your babies by the hundreds of thousands. You're losing your daughters. Your daughters are dying. The ignorance level is at an all time high. But you still turn to the one who put you there and ask him, Lady Brown. The question is, how do you fit in? The Republicans say, you don't. Point and simple. We're going to cut health care. We're going to alleviate unions. Unions have no more power. How many of you work for, for the man? You know, your union is, man, please. Your union don't have no power. <coughs> All right? Every 
every day jobs are being eliminated. So you ask your children to do something you won't do yourself. You ask them, come off the corner. What did you provide to bring them off the corner? That's the question. What did you provide? Pretend, oh, you know, we're going to go back to the man. He's going to fix the problem. The man will sit back and just say, keep on, kid. Keep on, man. Yeah. And while you do that, I'm going to keep on taxing. I'm going to make it higher and higher. And I'm going to take every dime you make. When are you going to start doing for yourself? I have to think new now. I, gotta think, I have to think beyond minimum wage when young brothers on the street are clocking in $1,500 uh, every two, three hours. Uh, and then I'm gonna tell him to go get a minimum wage job. He has forced me to think how to build industry so that when he comes away from a life of crime and we go into something legitimate, we can do something. That's when we're gonna get into some real warfare. Because I'm yeah. telling you, when you, try, when you start taking control of your own affairs, you're gonna find out our real enemy hasn't shown himself yet. The man in blue with the stick, he's just an agent for somebody. Uh, our real enemies will come out when we really take control of these streets and decide that we're gonna, we're gonna move our own affairs and that's where Minister Farrakhan is going now. That's why I wanted to raise the one question. How do we help every African-American man take ownership of his own life and participate in his own self-improvement? At the end of the day, as the, as the brother said, the one that was incarcerated said, he was in prison, he's out, and he's tired of the dialogue. I understand that. People need help, but helping them is one thing. They don't want to be me. They want to know how did I become me. To tell me, tell me how to manage my money. Most of them are shocked to find out that I lived on, I slept on the floor for 12 years. 12 years, saving $20 a week. Nobody didn't give me what I got. $20 a week for 12 years. Saved every dime and drove a, a, a hoopty. Where I couldn't even get out the driver's side because the door wouldn't come to me if I opened the door and fall off. <laughs> Nobody knew that. But they want to know how do I get that? You, this is not a prayer. No, come on, come on. This is not a prayer. This is work. I had to take ownership because my mother raised four children by herself. My father was never in my life. But I had to do it. What did we do? That's, that's, the, that's the, this is the challenge. What can we do? How can we help them do it for themselves? That's it. Dr. Edward Robinson was able about three or four years ago to get the Philadelphia School District to have a more Afrocentric curriculum where the kids graduating from Philadelphia schools have to learn more about black people and black history. And that's critically important because if my clients, mostly young black men, knew that the first human being on the planet 200,000 years ago was black. That's right. If these black guys knew that algebra and geometry and calculus came out of Africa, they'd be like, wow, that's a big thing. It's like if I know Barack Obama, if he ever has any children, ever has any male children, his sons are going to say, hey, I can be president because my pop is president. If you got a father who's a lawyer, hey, I can be a lawyer because my pop's a lawyer. So this didn't happen with black people because they were disconnected from their culture. We're the only people on the planet that, and I, I said two minutes, but give me 90 seconds more. I went to Masterman, one of the best schools in the city, and there was this Italian kid who I was really jealous of because this Italian kid could tell me where in Italy his grandfather lived. He could tell me what state in Italy he lived, what city in that state, what neighborhood in that city. He could tell me what block his father lived in Italy. All I know is that my grandparents came from Richmond, Virginia, and beyond that, I don't know. 
I'm disconnected from my language, my culture, my tradition, everything about me. So I'm a new human being beginning in 1619 in America. So as corny and as strained as it might sound, black folks are where they are because of the residue of slavery. Because if it's not the residue of slavery, then it's got to be we're genetically predisposed to be sociopathic. We're not. Somebody made us this way, and yeah, we can overcome it. You can have a Michael Cole, you can have a Rodney Muhammad, you can have a Kevin Chief, but why are we the exception? We shouldn't be the exception. So if we go back to the history, if we go back to what was taken from us, then we can understand why we are where we are. And let me just say the solutions, I'm sure at the end we're going to hear something, we want to hear them from the audience, but from my standpoint, the solution is this. Paid job training with an educational component that requires an Afrocentric historical educational basis. <laughs> If, if, you give a man, if you give a man a job, he tends not to commit a crime. But don't just give him a job, give him a paid job training that requires him to get his GED and that has African history courses as part of it. That's the solution. And, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as well as Minister Farrakhan, told us that, that they, they, they are in the Bible under the symbolic picture of Samson. Uh, Samson was a was a powerful uh, individual against the Philistines, only if the Spirit of God was on him. And um, everything that Samson did, he did it single-handed, and he did it on his own. This is the way they think out there. They're not looking for a coalition. They, they, you know, the young guys want to do it themselves. The other thing is, Samson got blinded, and by the time he took that kingdom down. Being blind, he couldn't get out from up under what the power of his destructive hand was bringing about. And that's where many of them are now. We're trying to, trying to get a set of eyes for them so they can see. But they, they are not trying to fit in. So going out just telling them to get a minimum wage job, keeping their nose clean while somebody else is dirtying up some other part of them, uh, that's not working for them. They want a new world. And really, parentally speaking, we lack the wisdom of how to bring that new world in for them. Uh, and that's why Jesus had to say, suffer unto me, the little children. Uh, because unless somebody's preaching something new coming in, uh, I just don't really feel that the young, the young men or the young women are really interested in us trying to remake them over to fit in a formula that they're not born to fit in. We person in here should read message to the black man mm -hmm. to themselves and with their children. A lot of people say, why should we read that? Because that's the start of dealing with the psychological damage that has been done to us. All right? Now, Uncle Elijah Muhammad set out to redirect our minds, just like Mr. Roger said, make it new man. But he also was taught that this damage is so extreme, so extreme, that you have to have a starting place. So he said to us that we needed to have the knowledge of God, self, and the devil. But it's your heart. We got a heart issue. We got to have a desire to do right. See, and if you have a desire to do right, there's many entities here that can accommodate and help and God and bring information to you, but you gotta want it. Ain't nobody gonna force this stuff on you, obviously. And, and, and a lot of us need a heart change. You see, only God can change your heart. You get all the knowledge you, you, you want to and get big headed, but your heart is still corrupt. You would never um, um, do what, what, what your mind said. You would never implement that stuff. You gotta change your heart. Your heart is where your desire is at. And unless your desires change, Unless, unless you get some, some uh, 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 your willpower back to do right, it's going to get worse. I, I want to thank all of my esteemed panelists. Um, it was truly an honor, and I mean a real honor. God showed me a dream. I'm going to go through this. And I will never forget this dream he showed me. He showed me Minister Farrakhan leading uh, a group of his, uh, his men, his FOI, through a door in a building, it's kind of a grayish building. 
And then behind that was Bishop Jimmy A. Ellis III, um, the, the pastor and founder of Victory Christian Center. Bishop came with his men. And they all went in this big auditorium. And Minister Farrakhan went up and began teaching. Um, and I saw the Muslims on one side. Then uh, Bishop Ellis came and he began to teach. And there was an explosion that this kind of took place. I mean, people were standing up and applauding or whatever. And, what I, and I looked out the audience, what I saw was, instead of Muslims on one side and Christians on the other side, everybody was intermingled. I never realized, that this was maybe a year ago, that that dream was today. Wow. And I want to thank my wife, yeah. because I will never forget, it was over the summer, um, God spoke to me when I went to Minister Ishmael Al-Islam's meeting, the last call for the 144,000. Now, I'm in a Muslim meeting, and at meeting, when the meeting began, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, Kevin, you must do the Black Male Conference. I went home to my wife, I said, baby, we got to do a conference. And she said, well, Kevin, if God put that in you, then yes, I'm behind you, we're going to do this conference. That's why it's important, brother, to pick the right mate. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Sure. That's why. Because that thing will alter you. That thing will change your destiny. Trust me. You know? And so the Daily News picked up on that. And I'm glad that they did quote that. Because that was true. And because I left something to that Minister Ishmael and I said before we went on a radio broadcast together, and he said, This is a conference because why? We are conferring with one another to address the sickness and insanity in our community so that we can come up with the correct diagnosis so that we can come up with the correct medicine to dispense. And so to all of my esteemed candidates, thank you so much. And thank you all right.